get going here, I just want to wish Pastor Mike a happy birthday. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, I had to lean over and ask my wife, how old am I? She says, you're 62. I, I, I knew I was either 62 or 63, but I, I got a birthday coming up here in a, in a couple of months. I'll be 63 in November. So I'm, amen. So I'm, I'm, I'm right behind Pastor Mike. But you know what? Um, it is a, a, a blessing to our lives to have known uh, Pastor Mike and Gloria for uh, now. It's been, uh, I think it's been over 20 years now. We started ministering for Pastor Mike uh, in the about the early to mid 90s, and he's been a, he's been a, a good friend, amen to us. And uh, you know uh, when you got relationships that last that long, come on, you know you got a good friend. And uh, you know the older you get, you value those long term relationships in the Lord. And we, we, got, we, got, we got a lot of relationships like that. I'm blessed to say that we have a lot of friends that have been with us that long. But he's one of them, and I wanted to thank him for having us in once again. And, you know, uh, very few times have I ever asked him, can we come and minister where he said no. I think maybe one or twice. I mean, it's been very few, and he's always, uh, uh, you know, makes his pulpit available, and we, we appreciate that, Pastor Mike. We really do. And anyway, but uh, uh, I'll tell you, I don't know where they get them songs from. <laughs> but man, I don't know where they get them songs from. But let me tell you something. Amen. You know what? They get you going. Hello. <laughs> Amen. So uh, uh, I just want to uh, uh, commend the, the praise team and the singer. And, and I was looking, who's singing, man? I said, now this brother ain't singing over here. And that brother ain't singing. And Pastor Mike ain't singing lead I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah, I said, oh, it's the drummer, man. It's the drummer. Come on, give the drummer some props. Amen. And, you know, how, how many know that, that that takes some skill to be able to play them drums that well? Hello. And be able to sing. Come on. And I mean sing with some soul. Hallelujah. And sing, sing, amen, sing well. Praise the Lord. So where's my brother that's playing drums? Where's my brother? Amen. I just want to just, amen. Come on, let's give our brother a big hand clap. Amen. Uh, what's your name, my friend? Rick. Rick, all right. Well, praise God. I'll tell you, there was years ago, uh, I, I know Rick knows, but remember Buddy Miles? Man, I'll tell you, Buddy Miles, man, the expressway to your skull. Hello. <laughs> but, man, I'll tell you, I remember them, uh, Buddy Miles, man, he was singing and he'd play, but I'll tell you, brother, brother, Brother reminds me of Buddy Miles a little bit. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, uh, we want to uh, make you aware we have our table set up as you leave the church through the foyer with uh, our products that are designed to uh, build you up in the spirit, our teaching and preaching CDs, our booklets, our praise and worship. And uh, so make sure you go by there and pick up something. Can use it for yourself, get it for someone else or use it and then pass it on. And uh, uh, that helps support the traveling ministry to a certain degree. And then don't forget, Petro's in the house. Everybody say Petro in the house. <laughs> Petro, little piggy bank, still taking donation for gas. And on this trip, on this trip, we are officially going to break 300,000 miles on that vehicle. Come on. Man. Take a licking and keep on ticking. Uh, it's a 2005. Okay, 2005, so that's way eight, nine years old. But we got it really at the beginning of 2006, right, when it was getting ready to change and brand new. But I'll tell you, that car's still running good. And uh, whenever I get to, a, a, like I get from uh, L.A. to Phoenix, I check my oil, or I get from Phoenix to L.A., or whatever, I'm traveling, you know, a few hours, check oil. And boy, I'll tell you, the last a, a few times, I mean, no, your oil's full. You're not leaking any oil, man. I say, wow, that's God. Hello. Yeah. That's God, because uh, you know cars that old usually leak in oil by now. But man, God's keeping that car going, and so we, we praise the Lord till he opens the door for a new one. And maybe somebody get blessed and say, hey, I want to buy Chris and Christine a new car. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll receive it. Amen. We'll receive it. Praise the Lord. 
But uh, go buy, even if you don't buy something, make sure you go buy and feed the pig today. Hello. Come on. He's hungry today. He's empty. And you guys always feed him usually really good here. So we, we appreciate that. And if you need to use a credit card for any of your business, uh, we can make that happen. So just let Christine know you, you got plastic today instead of cash or, or check. And, and we can uh, ring you up. Amen. With our iPhone. Hallelujah. Listen, uh, I... I, uh, I I, I, I want to change the title of the message. The, the sister came up to me before service and said, uh, what are you going to minister today? And I gave her a title. And, uh, but while I was sitting there, like it's been happening lately, uh, the Lord changes the message. And how, how many know we got to just go with the leading of the Lord? Yeah. Amen. You know, I had something else, but, you know, the Lord said, no, uh, this is the word for today. So we're going to just be obedient to that. So I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 16. Isaiah chapter 16 today, and uh, we want to look at the, the fifth verse, Isaiah 16 and verse 5. And uh, the, the lady might be wondering back there, well, what's the title of the message now? Well, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, I have a, This is a new message, so I haven't given it an official title. Um, I, I, uh, I uh, have been... Uh, referring it to as the burden of the Lord. And then, uh, and then uh, I've even been playing around with the judgments of God. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll try and let you know before the, uh, the end of the, the message here today. But uh, if I don't, you just put a title on it. We'll just maybe you come up with a better title than, than I've come up with so far. But uh, uh, Isaiah 16 and verse 5, it, it says, And in mercy, everybody say mercy. In mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging, seeking judgment, and hasting righteousness. Another translation says, a throne shall be established in loving kindness. Amen. So, Father, we thank you that your word is alive and powerful and shall not return to you void, but shall accomplish that which you please and shall prosper in the lives of your people here today. Thank you, Father. You get, gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us your word. We yield to him now that he'd cause the word to come forth with power, that it would truly penetrate our hearts and minds today. We ask it in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said together, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. A mercy shall be established. In mercy, rather, shall the throne be established. And you know, God is still establishing his throne in the hearts of men and women today. Amen. And, uh, you know, that's why Jesus said we were to pray daily, thy kingdom come. Come on. Thy kingdom come. And, you know, when you talk about kingdoms, you're talking about a king that has dominion, kingdom, hello, amen. And God wants to exercise his sovereignty and dominion in the lives of, of men and women today. And, you know, uh, he is going to do that whether you like it or not. God shall establish his dominion and sovereignty over the nations, whether they like it or not. And uh, it's not really a question of will, he, will you submit to his sovereignty Will you let him establish his throne in your life? That's not the question, because he's going to do that. The question is, when will you allow him to do that? Come on. Come on. When will you allow him to establish his throne in your life? Now, you know what? I think most people in this room have already done that. You've made him a Lord and Savior of your life. Hello. You have fulfilled that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Come on. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, but thy will. And so the question is, uh, when will you allow him to establish his throne in your life? Will you do it now? Come on. Have you done it now? Or will you wait until that day where you will be forced <laughs> to uh, 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 confess him as Lord? Like the Bible says that, you know what, at that day that, you know what? Every knee shall bow. Come on, every knee. Everybody say every knee. Every knee shall bow. That means, uh, you know what? Uh, the atheist, the, uh, the, the Muslim, uh, 
uh, the agnostic, uh, uh, the intellectual, no matter who you are, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and in earth. Come on. Amen. And what are they going to bow at? They're going to bow at the name of Jesus. Come on. At the name of Jesus. Come on. Not at the name of Mumu or Chichu or, or Buddha or whoever. Amen. It's going to be at the name of Jesus. Uh, every knee shall bow. And then it goes on to say, and every tongue. Come on. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. I'm still talking about God establishing his throne. Come on. But he's going to establish it in mercy. My, my. And so uh, in this book of Isaiah, especially chapters 13 to 27, there's a list of God's judgments on the nations. And, you know, a lot of churches, they don't want to really like to talk about judgments. Because uh, you know they're 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 way over on the other end of the of the scale there, or the, uh, the they let the pendulum swing way to the other side. Where now they want to just talk about grace. They don't want to talk about judgment. Now I believe in both. I believe in grace. Come on, I'm a recipient of God's grace. Amen. But I do also know the Bible talks about judgments. Now a lot of people attach a negative connotation to that word judgment. And that's because they don't have a biblical view of the word judgment. Now, for instance, the scripture that says judgment shall begin in the house of the Lord. A lot of people run with that scripture and, you know, say how God's going to destroy the church or God's going to bring, you know, a, a rain down lightning bolts out of heaven. Listen, I learned a long time ago that scripture judgment begins in the house of the Lord. That means like we were singing, Jesus is going to fix it. I said, Jesus is going to fix it. I was mad hearing my sermon all through them old songs. Amen. You know what? Jesus, he's going to bring judgment to the house of the Lord, but not to destroy it, but to fix it. Come on, to fix it. Hallelujah. Come on, look at somebody and tell them again, he's going to fix it. Come on now. He's going to fix it. Uh, and I heard it put another way. Uh, he's going to bring order. He's going to set things back in order. Everything that's out of order, judgment's going to come to the house, but to set it in order so that it works like it should work. Come on. So that it'll function like it should function. Come on. So that it will uh, uh, resemble what he has destined that it would resemble. Come on. Now, in those chapters I mentioned here in Isaiah, uh, there are 10 burdens, and that's the way they're referred to, burdens. Now, Pastor Mike, he got saved in 74. I got saved in 75. Uh, we just celebrated our spiritual birthday in June, 40 years. 40 years of walking with the Lord. Come on. Amen. I mean, time flies when you're having a good time. But, you know, uh, when we started out, that, that was a, 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 an expression you heard quite a bit. People were always talking about the burden of the Lord. God's given me a burden for this or a burden for that. Come on. You may not hear it as much today, but it's definitely a biblical term. Come on. And Isaiah referred to these uh, ten judgments on, uh, on ten nations. Uh, uh, the judgments against Babylon and in Assyria and Philistia. The judgments of God against Moab and Syria and Israel, Ethiopia, Egypt, Arabia, the city of Tyre and, and the nation of Judah. And, and Isaiah refers to these messages of God's judgments as, as, as burdens. And, uh, you know, I, I began to study out why, why were they called burdens? Because these prophetic declarations that the prophets were making uh, 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 were especially solemn and, and weighty because of what they talked about. Uh, God, they were pronouncing God's judgment, which many times meant that there was going to calamity was going to come. Hello. There was going to come some unpleasant things. And so, you know, uh, they're called burdens because uh, they actually weighed down or oppress the mind and the heart of the prophet. I heard somebody say the other day, that, you know, uh, probably these Old Testament prophets were probably uh, 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 depressed <laughs> at times. Come on. Because they knew that word that they were going to bring wasn't going to uh, bring them popularity. 
wasn't going to garden, garner them adulation. Come on. But it might bring about a big rock in their head. Hello. Because how many know they stoned the prophets in the Old Testament? They killed them because they didn't like the message many times that they were bringing. And so, you know, some of them might have been depressed or troubled because, oh, Lord, I don't want to bring that word because I know it might end up getting me killed. Hello. But these pronouncements are over the nations. Uh, it really reveals the Lord not only as the God of Israel. How many understand he's not just the God of Israel? I said he's just not the God of Israel. But he's the God who rules all the nations of the earth. He rules all the nations of the earth. As a matter of fact, Daniel 5.21 says that the most high God. Come on. Now, there's other gods, but he's the most high. Hello. And it says he rules over the kingdoms of the world. And he appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. Now, there's a lot of talk uh, uh, among people about the upcoming elections in 2016, I guess it's going to be, right? And uh, people are, you know, talking about this candidate, that. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, that's all good and well. But listen, the person who belongs in that office as a leader of this nation or any nation for that matter is going to be the one that God appoints. Now, some people may not believe that, but I believe that's what the Bible says and that's what I believe. Come on. Whoever's in there, it's because God has appointed it, whether you like it or not, come on, whether they got good policies or not, for whatever reason that we may not be able to understand, God has appointed that person, come on. Now, I, I want to focus on one of the nations, just one, that God said he was going to bring judgment, and it was a nation of Moab. And in, 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 in that next chapter uh, before 16, uh, chapter 15 and, and, and verse 1, uh, it talks about uh, the burden. Uh, it says the burden of Moab and how they were going to be laid waste and uh, how, how uh, uh, the judgment was going to come in the nighttime unexpectedly. Come on, kind of like that scripture we heard how the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. Come on, unexpected uh, destruction, judgment was going to come upon Moab. But notice it's referred to, uh, once again, as a burden. And uh, you know what? Uh, just quickly, we need to uh, get the background, the background to what I want to speak about. And, and in order to do that, we, we need to just consider Lot for a moment here. Remember Abraham's nephew, Lot? Come on. Lot was with uh, uh, his uncle Abraham when Abraham left uh, uh, the land of, of Haran there and and, and, and God said, I'm going to lead you to a land that, that you know not of. And he didn't even know where he was going. But God says, but when you get to that place, that's going to be your possession forever. The land I'm going to give you is going to be your possession forever. So, so Lot was by his uncle's side there. And uh, how many remember Abraham was very wealthy? Come on. Very wealthy. And, you know, they measured their wealth predominantly through their the size of their, of their uh, cattle and their herds and their flocks and their, all their livestock. And, and so as a result of being Abraham's nephew, Lot became quite wealthy himself. And uh, you read about that in Genesis 13. But because of their combined wealth, uh, they were forced to separate because uh, they couldn't find enough land to feed all of Abraham's livestock and to feed all of Lot's livestock, so they had to separate. And so uh, God let Lot choose what land he was going to have for his livestock, and so uh, he gave him first choice. And, and on the surface, it seemed to be a good choice because Lot chose the land that was the most fertile. Come on. And it says in Genesis 13 that Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. So in other words, it was green, not like a lot of the landscape we see coming from Southern California, traveling up here, man, it's all brown now because of the drought. I mean, it's, you know, pretty unattractive. But, you know, Lot chose that land that was green and lush and, and well watered, and, and so he, he journeyed east. 
Everybody say he journeyed east. And you know anything about the points of the compass in the Bible, symbolically, they usually speak of something. And when you talk about the east point of the compass, that's usually spoke of destruction or spoke of judgment. In other words, there was not a, a, a good connotation when you talked about the east point of the compass because Lot went east, but Abraham went west. And west was the point that spoke of blessing, prosperity. Come on. Look at somebody and tell them, go west, young man. Come on, tell them, go west, young man. Come on. Amen. But, but Lot went east. Amen. And, and, and it says that he separated himself from his uncle. And uh, Abraham went and dwelt in the land of Canaan. But Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Come on. Amen. He went to the well watered. You know, it's kind of like the saying, you know, you, uh, you know uh, the, the grass is greener on the other side. But people don't realize there's a bigger water bill associated. Come on with that. Come on. Amen. Bigger water bill over there. Hello. And so Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And you know the story. Eventually, he traded his tent in for a townhouse in Sodom. Come on. And it wasn't too long before Lot's living in Sodom. And it wasn't too long before Sodom started living in him. Come on. Amen. The spirit of Sodom entered his character, entered his nature. And as a result of his choice, this tells, you, this tells us about the choices we make in life. You know, Lot, Lot chose the immediate and he forsook the eternal. Come on. A lot of times we want to bring something, choose something that's going to bring us immediate gratification. Hello. Don't look at me like that. You chose that man or woman because you wanted immediate gratification. And now you realize you made the wrong choice. Come on now. Now God's going to give you, God give you grace now to live with that choice. Come on. So be careful about the choices you make in life. But Lot, the, because of that choice he made to live there by Sodom and eventually, uh, 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 by Sodom and eventually in Sodom, as a result, that choice brought war to his life. Come on, Genesis 14. Uh, he got kidnapped. My, my. Uh, he ended up vexing his righteous soul. Hello. Because of the, the corruption and the immorality of the, the citizens of Sodom. Uh, he lost all material wealth in the end. And then even lost a wife in the process. Come on. Now this leads us to the history of Moab. Because something else happened as a result. Remember Lot... And his family escaped Sodom before God brought judgment and destroyed the city. But you remember, and, and my message was going to be remember Lot's wife, but that's not the message. But you remember Lot's wife, what happened to her? What did she do? She looked back. God had given them strict instructions. Do not stop. Do not look back. But what did she do? She looked back. For whatever reason, that would have been a whole sermon. And maybe I'll preach it next time I come. But Jesus said, remember Lot's wife in Luke 17, 32. And there's lessons to be learned. But she looked back and what happened? She turned into a pillar of salt. She died. She perished. And Lot escaped with his daughters. And remember, maybe you don't know this story. But what happened is uh, his daughters didn't have any children. Their husbands were left behind there in Sodom. And so they came up with a scheme to get their father drunk, come on, and then to lay with their father to have children. Don't look at me like that, amen. You hear well, weird things like that happening all the time in society we live in, come on. I heard about some lady who gave up her kid for adoption and then found him on Facebook, ended up meeting him, he was 16 years old, and she ended up laying with him and... Come on, having physical relationship. Come on. And as a result, went to prison for nine years. Come on. I mean, you know, and you know, and I may be talking to somebody here that you've been through stuff like that. Come on. You've been through some incestuous stuff going on. Come on. My, 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 my wife experienced that growing up. Come on. 
with relatives molesting her and stuff like that. Come on. And uh, his daughters got pregnant. And uh, the eldest daughter had a son from her father. And she named the son Moab. Come on, that's why we're talking about this, because this is the origins of the nation of Moab. And the uh, younger daughter uh, got pregnant as well and had a son and named him Ammon. Come on. And these are the origins of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Come on. Amen. And, and how many know these were cousin nations to Israel? And they're still in existence today. Come on, the origins of these, uh, 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 of these nations that are around there and causing all this trouble and going through all these changes, they're, 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 they originated with the, uh, uh, the Moabites and some of them from the Ammonites. And they were always living in the shadow of their cousin next door, Israel, but actually they were family. Come on. And, and nothing, uh, nothing was stopping them from uh, embracing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, uh, and, 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 and experiencing the true worship of the living God. God gave them every opportunity, but you know what? Instead, they made a choice. And they chose to be Israel's enemy. Come on. They chose to serve idols and worship idols rather than the true and living God. Come on, are you with me so far? I'm going somewhere, cause so you got to concentrate. You got to think today. And, and you know, God even gave... Specific instructions to Israel, he said in Deuteronomy 2.9, he says, Do not harass Moab or provoke them to war because I'm not going to give you uh, any of their land because I've promised it to the sons of Lot. Come on. So right there we see God, he's, 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 he's watching over Moab. Now, and even though Moab, we know what happened, uh, they were responsible. Remember Balak, king of Moab? He tried to hire Balaam to curse Israel. Read about that in Numbers 22 through 24. Uh, uh, many times it was the Moabite women that were used to seduce the men of Israel. Come on. Numbers 31. And then, then during the time of the judges, Moab's king... Eglon attacked Israel and captured Jericho and afflicted Israel for 18 years. I mean, these people are always a thorn in the side. Come on, to Israel. And you know, God, uh, he expressly forbid contact with the Moabites because they had violated the sanctity of marriage. Come on, with what happened with Lot and his daughters. I mean, the sanctity of sex, it was completely violated there. Because God said, and it shall be to a husband and a wife, a man and his wife, that there shall be a, 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 a production of children. Come on. But they perverted that. They violated that. And so God said, no, no contact with the Moabites, even though we know Solomon had a Moabite wife. Come on. And uh, they became the, one of the targets for God's judgment. They are one of the, the ten burdens. And as a matter of fact, uh, it says, uh, look there in Isaiah again, the next verse after five, uh, five, look in verse six. We have heard of the pride of Moab, for he is very proud even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lie shall not be so. So they, God targets, God targets some things in Moab for judgment. And uh, Jeremiah eight twenty nine, write it down, but it says, We've heard of the pride of Moab, exceeding proud, his arrogancy, the haughtiness of his heart. So God targets the pride of Moab, very proud people. And make no mistake about it, God still targets these things in our lives too. He'll target these areas in our life. Now, once again, to bring judgment, but once again, not to destroy, but to fix it. Come on. Amen. God, but Pastor Mike was talking about how God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. He frustrates the proud. Come on. He opposes the proud. But he gives grace and favor and blessing to the humble. Come on. We got any humble servants of the Lord in here today? Now, pride we know puffs up. Come on. Pride puffs up. 
Uh, it, 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 you people think that they're hot when they're not. Come on now. Uh, it's a, it develops a sense of self-importance. Come on. A lot of time because uh, they think of what they have accomplished and their works and their, come on, uh, and, and you know, maybe they got money. Come on, they got a title or whatever. Pride can, can contribute to that or that can contribute to pride. And, and, and pride uh, also creates a spirit of independence that refuses to submit to the lordship of Jesus. Come on, people, you know, a lot of times they don't want to make Jesus the Lord of life because they're prideful. So, well, I'm educated. I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a position in the community. I have a, I have a big office or whatever. I, I, I live on the hill in a nice big house. Or, you know, and, 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 and because of that, uh, that prevents them from humbling themselves and, and you know, making Jesus the Lord of their life, a spirit of independence. And you know, even in the church, there's even a spirit of independence operating at times. Come on. People say, well, I ain't going to do what Pastor Mike says to do. I'm not going to say what any of my elders say. To, I'm not going to let man tell me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. Hello, I know better. You know, that's all pride. Uh, a pride, uh, you know, prefers its own wisdom rather than the wisdom of God, rather than the revelation of God. Pride many times seeks its own agenda. See, God's going to target this stuff. Seeks its own agenda rather than the interests of the kingdom of God. Sometimes people want to, and I, and, I, and I was, you know, uh, blessed to hear how these young people have, have, you know, even though sometimes, like Pastor Mike says, they, you know, roll their eyes or whatever, but they, they are submitted to the, the leadership in this house. Come on. Because a lot of times uh, uh, people, they, uh, they have their own agenda. They rather tear up the whole church than submit to the leadership. Come on. And I know... I know this pastor, and I know I've been through that as well when we were pastoring. But like I said, God resists the proud. He always opposes the proud. There were some other characteristics of the Moabites that God targeted for judgment. Jeremiah 48, 11. And, and, and it says this, Moab hath been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his lees, had not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Rather, he hath gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remains in him, and his scent is not changed. So now, uh, Jeremiah the prophet is using the language of the vineyard of making wine to talk about Moab. He says, uh, Moab hasn't been through the process like wine is put through to, to make a, a better tasting wine. Pastor Mike was even talking about that. You know, he wants to, he wants to uh, 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 I don't know if he used the expression, but that's what he was implying, that you know what, you should get better with age in the Lord. A sweeter fragrance, come on. A better taste, come on. Amen. A sweeter nature, come on. Amen, come on. Amen, you know what? We should improve with age. But you know what? Moab, uh, because uh, they had taken it easy, one translation says. Lazy as a dog in the sun, this translation said. Never had to work for a living. Never faced any trouble. Never had to grow up. Never once worked up a sweat. I'm reading a translation of what I just read earlier. But those days are a thing of the past. I'll put him to work hard labor that will wake him up to the world of hard knocks. So uh, they hadn't been through that process where their, their taste had changed, their scent had changed. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to the Laodicean church in Revelation 3. He says, uh, you know what? You taste so bad, I'm going to have to spew you out of my mouth. Because the Laodiceans had also become complacent. Come on, self-satisfied. They had a, 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 an unsavory taste. But the prophet is talking about God wants to establish his throne in Moab. And he's going to do it with loving kindness. Come on. And you know, this, uh, this was not the type of model uh, that was there in the Middle East. When you talked about a throne in the Middle East... You talked about a heavy handedness. You talked about ruling with a rod of iron. You talked about ruling by force and by terror. Come on. But now God says, I'm going to establish my throne in mercy or loving kindness. In other words, he says, I'm going to establish my throne, but it's going to be in faithfulness. It's going to be in righteousness. 
uh, it, it's going to be uh, uh, in, in love and, and, and mercy. And see, this is what Moab could have had. They could have had this, but instead they chose pride. They chose conceit. They chose arrogance. They chose to be defiant. But you know what? In Isaiah 15, 5, Isaiah 15, 5, look what it says there. Isaiah 15, 5, it says, My heart shall cry out for Moab. I believe this is not the prophet's be. I believe this is what God was saying. He says, my heart weeps for Moab. Now, you think about this. I mean, if, if God was the type of God that, you know, a lot of religious people want to portray him as, God should have wiped out Lot and his Cochina daughters right at the very beginning. Come on now. I'm sorry, I forgot. Not everybody speaks back. Cochina means nasty. <laughs> Come on. You know what I'm talking about? Nasty. I mean, come up with a plan like this. You know, you got to be nasty. And I, I don't know where they learned that from. I don't think they learned it from the neighbors. They might have learned it from their mother. Hello. I don't know. I mean, being citizens of Sodom, come on. And, you know, you think about it, God should have just blasted them right there. I mean, he should have just wiped them out right there. But now he's saying, my heart weeps for Moab. Come on. In other words, he's saying, I have compassion for them. I have a love for them. Do you love the sinner? Do you love that transgender person? Come on. You're going to have to learn how to love them. Now they're taking over. Come on, they want to take over now. Transgender bathrooms at Target now. Transgender this, transgender that. Come on. We're truly living in the days of Lot. Truly living in the days of Lot, like Jesus said in Luke 17. But God's saying, I, I, I weep for them. How, how, can, how can God both punish to the point of devastation and then weep for the people at the same time? You know, we have a hard time understanding that because we as human beings, uh, you know, we, we, we compartmentalize our emotions. Come on. But you can't do that with God. See, I'll give you an example. Those of you who have ever raised children and you've ever had to discipline them. Now, I realize the younger generation nowadays, it's all about time out. We're going to give the kid a time out. Well, when I raised my kids, it was all about, you know what? Put the Board of Education to the seat of understanding. Hello. Come on now. Or doing what the Bible says. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And I had an instrument of discipline in my house, and it was a, 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 a rubber a cutting board, a, like, a, like a, a plastic cutting board. And, you know, I didn't have to use it too often with my daughter, but when it came time to have to use it, it was, you know what, like you do in school, bend over and touch your ankles. Come on now. How many ever got swatted in school besides me? Come on. I, I got swatted. Hello. And, man, it wasn't a little plastic, plastic uh, 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 cutting board. It was a big old wooden paddle with holes in it. Come on. Right. Ooh, and the vice principal usually administered that discipline. Come on. Right. But I'm talking about how can God both punish to the point of devastation and at the same time weep for the people? Well, sometimes when you have to discipline your kids in that manner, what do you tell them? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And the kid is saying, yeah, right. <laughs> but this is kind of essence what's happening here. This, this, this hurt God to have to judge his, uh, Moab. This hurt him. And yet his love, we see many times his love working together with his holiness, with his justice, his love many times working together with his mercy. His compassion all at the same time. How many understand that's too deep for us to comprehend? You can't comprehend that. That's why I believe Paul wrote what he said in uh, uh, Ephesians 3, 18, 19. That you may be able to feel and understand as all God's children should. How long? Say how long. How wide? Say how wide. How deep? How high? 
His love really is. Come on. I remember that song from the Bee Gees, How Deep Is Your Love? Da, da, da. Well, God's love is not only deep, but it's high, it's long, and it's wide. Come on. And it goes on to say in Ephesians, to experience this love for yourselves. Though it is so great, you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. This is what we see in play here. As God brings judgment on Moab, but at the same time, he's weeping for Moab. You see, you ask yourself once again, why didn't God just destroy Lot and his daughters? Well, Ezekiel 33, 11 says, do I have pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord God, rather that he should turn from his ways and live. See, that's the heart of God. That's the whole story of the Bible, God's redemptive plan. Come on. The principle of the cross. Come on. The innocent paying the price for the guilty. Come on. The New Testament equivalent of Ezekiel is 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. See, because God didn't bring judgment on Lot and his daughters right away, didn't, didn't mean God was condoning that type of behavior. A lot of times we mistake that when God doesn't judge us right away for things we may be doing that are wrong. We say, oh, well, I guess God's winking at that. I guess God's condoning. No, it's the long suffering of God. God, amen, is long suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. No, that's not God winking at your sin. He's just saying, I'm long suffering and I'm giving you time to repent. I'm giving you time, come on, amen, to turn from your ways and live. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap today. And we're going to see how out of this depravity, out of this sin and corruption, God is still working at that time to produce a Messiah, to bring forth Jesus, come on. And you'll see many times the seed of sin and evil uh, uh, right by uh, uh, the seed God has chosen growing side by side. But how many understand that Satan was always working even back then uh, uh, seeking to destroy God's seed, seeking to, to make it impossible for the Messiah to come forth. And as you study the Old Testament especially and watch as God's plan or, or, or God's line of succession to bring about the Messiah, that many times it was nearly broken, that line of succession was nearly destroyed. But God somehow, some way, always made a way to escape at the last minute. Let me give you an example. Remember when Pharaoh wanted to break the line of succession, and he said, I want you to throw all the children of the Hebrews into the River Nile. Come on. And that way, Satan thought he was going to get rid of the seed that would bring forth the Messiah. But what happened? Moses' mama, come on, built him a little arky arky. Come on now. And put him in that river Nile that was meant for his destruction, and it floated him right into Pharaoh's palace. Come on. That's a good example. The enemy tried to do the same thing at the birth of Jesus. Remember when Herod made a decree, all children of the Hebrews, two years and under, kill them. Come on. So God did what? He gave a dream to the parents of Jesus, told them to escape, get out of Dodge. Come on now, because you're in danger. Hello. See, that's what I'm talking about. The enemy was always trying to Break that line of succession. Always trying to destroy that seed. And, and, you know, he's trying to do the same thing in us today. He's trying to hinder that process, trying to abort that process uh, uh, that God uh, uh, says that he wants to uh, see Christ formed in us. That's why Paul said, listen, uh, Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth. He was travailing in birth that there would be something birthed again until uh, uh, Christ be formed in you. But the enemy, he's even trying to abort that process. But we can't allow him to. Come on. We must continue to persevere. We must continue, amen, to yield, amen, to that 
process that God has started in us. Amen. God says he will bring that good work. Come on. Amen. To completion. He will develop that good work, perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. What is he going to bring to completion? Christ in you. Christ being formed in you. The hope of glory. Anyway, so one day, Satan thought, you know what, he had won the victory here. He thought he had, you know what, I, 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 I got now God in a place where, you know, that line is going to be broken, you know, hasn't been completed yet. So, you know, uh, he thought that he had outfoxed God. How many of you can never outfox God? I don't care how smart that. And the devil's smart. The devil's a diabolical genius. But he's still no match for God. He thinks he's slick. God is slicker. Come on. And you know what? God found somebody through whom that line of succession would be maintained. He found the one person to which he could continue to bring forth that seed of the Messiah. And guess where he found it? He found it in the Moabites. He found it in that girl named Ruth. The Moabites. I'm talking about God says in mercy shall my throne be established. In loving kindness shall my throne be established. Come on. And that throne he was talking about was the throne of David. Amen. And anyway, but he found that girl named Ruth. The one who turned from her idols. Come on. And she turned to the true and living God. Come on, remember her pledge? She told her mother-in-law, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Come on. I will, in mercy, will I establish my throne. Think about it. Out of an utterly corrupt people, out of an utterly depraved people, out of an utterly wicked people, God, God, God got a hold of one girl who would turn from her gods and serve the true and living God. Amen. Praise God. And you know what? A lot of you can relate how God established his throne in your life in mercy. Some of us were just as utterly depraved and corrupt. Come on. Wicked. But yet God found some way to establish his throne in our lives. In loving kindness and in mercy. Pastor was talking about it all through the, through the worship service. How many times when he didn't even call on his name, God showed up. When he didn't deserve it, God showed up. God came through. Come on. I, I know many of you can relate to that. God was talking to you. And there may be some out there today that say, well, you know what, I, I'm, too, I, I, I'm, too, uh, I'm too lost. I, I'm a lost case. I've done too many things that, that, that God, he could never forgive me. Come on. There may be someone in here today. I, I've committed some sins that I wouldn't want anyone to know about. Yet God knows about them, but God's ready to in mercy, establish his throne in your life. In loving kindness, establish his throne in your life. And you know, Ruth, that Moabitess, the one from those depraved people, she eventually became the great-grandmother of King David. My, my. Come on. Amen. And she is listed as part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. What a wonderful God we serve. That's why he's called the great redeemer. Amen. Job 19.25, he says, For I know that my redeemer lives. Hallelujah. Come on, my redeemer lives. Why is he the great redeemer? Because he not only redeemed us from our sins of the past, he's redeeming us from our faults and failures and mistakes of the present. And he shall redeem us even in the future. Come on, on that day. Where we, come on, somebody give him praise. 
on that day in the future, while corruption shall put on incorruption, and mortality shall put on immortality, and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, amen, where we shall experience that ultimate redemption, where we shall receive, amen, a new body, come on, a new body that will never get sick, never die, come on, hallelujah, praise God. Judgment. Judgment's a good thing. I want to encourage you to look at the judgments of God as a good thing because it's not meant for destruction. It's meant to bring about redemption. I want to close with this scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. Because God says, listen, I want you to judge yourself so I don't have to judge you. He gives us the opportunity to judge ourselves. Come on. And you know what? We'd be better off judging ourselves than waiting until he judges us. Come on. And it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32, for if we would judge ourselves, in other words, detect our own shortcomings, not everyone else's shortcomings, detect your own shortcomings. Uh, judge yourself, recognizing your own condition, it says. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But, everybody say but. but. When we are judged, or when we are chastened, or disciplined of the Lord. How many understand? He's, our, he's, he's daddy God. And like you discipline your kids, well, if we don't straighten out, he'll discipline us too. But not that we should be condemned with the world. That's why he disciplines us and chastises us, that we would not be condemned with the world. In mercy shall my throne be established. In loving kindness shall my throne be established. Stand to your feet. Once again, Paul said, I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work, perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Thank you, Father, for your mercy, for your loving kindness. Thank you, Father, that you never give up on us. You never give up no matter how wicked, no matter how depraved, no matter how lost, no matter how far gone, you are committed to bring redemption to our lives. And I want to offer an opportunity and so, for someone who may be here today. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've never given him the opportunity to establish his throne in your life, to sit on the throne of your heart as Lord. But you want to make that decision today to give him the reins of your life, to let him take control, where it's no longer your will be done, but it's his will be done. I want to give that opportunity for anyone that may be here today that wants to make that decision. Make it now voluntarily. Don't be forced to make it on that day. When you might have a big old angel standing over you with a sword in his hand. Forcing you to bow your knee. Forcing you to confess with your tongue. I say choose life today. God says I, choose, I put before you life and death. Choose life, he said. I, I said before you blessing and cursing. He said choose blessing. Will you choose blessing today? Will you choose life? Will you voluntarily allow God to establish his throne in your life? And may, there may be some in here today, you did it at one time, but you know what? You got back on that throne and you started calling the shots. But you say, I want to confess him as Lord. I want to tell him once again to take control of my life. Be Lord of my life. I, I, I've tried it and it doesn't work. I, I'm ready to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. And if that's you today, we want to give that opportunity. 
for you to come and get some prayer today. If that's you on either or, you know what, you might be in here feeling like, you know what, I'm too, I'm, I'm, I'm too bad, I'm too, I'm too evil, I'm too sinful. Don't believe that lie of the devil. We saw that story today of how God said, listen, even those utterly depraved, wicked people, out of them I'm going to bring someone. Out of them I'm going to raise up someone that I can bring about my plan of redemption. No one is unredeemable. No one is unredeemable. Come on, no one is unredeemable. The only one that's unredeemable is the devil. But other than that, there's no one that's unredeemable. You may be feeling like that. Listen, you need to come and say, God, I'm going to receive your gift, your gift of Jesus Christ. I'm going to receive and what he did for me on the cross. I'm going to receive it by faith, not by how I feel, not by what even my mind tells me. I'm going to come and receive it by faith and believe that your great love your great love. Nothing can separate me from your great love. If that's you on any one of those invitations, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life, you need to get your heart right with God, or you need to just say, I am coming because I believe that I'm not too far gone, that God can save me, God can redeem me. If that's you on any one of those invitations, and you need prayer, will you come quickly? Come quickly at this time. Come quickly at this time. We're a little past one.